Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the garden question and answer video that I do pretty much every Sunday. You can ask gardening questions down in the comment section below this video. That's where you're, uh, uh, that's where you ask questions. Uh, if it seems relevant, include the uh, horticultural zone that you live in, because sometimes uh, that's helpful in answering the uh, answering your questions. Thank you guys so much for participating in this video, because without you, there isn't a subscriber question and answer video. Uh, and you guys just continue to ask such great questions uh, every week. So I, uh, you know, I appreciate that. I always think I'm going to run out of questions. And sometimes it's a little bit similar questions, but they can be asked in different ways. And that's one of the things I've learned over the years in horticulture is sometimes the same question can be asked several different ways and sometimes answering it a few different ways, same answer, but answering it slightly from a slightly different question uh, is helpful for someone to learn, you know, to learn the answers to, the, to, to you know, to some of these horticulture questions we have. The uh, weekly garden planner, I finished June. So we're currently there's March, April, May, and June fully finished on the weekly garden planner and we've shot July. And maybe by the time you're looking at seeing this, I will, I'm looking over, Holly's out here, but I don't know if she's gonna come through the camera or not. Normally she does. Uh, uh, by the time you're watching this, maybe the first week or two of July will be edited and up. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. But the la this is the last few days of the $30 off discount on the weekly garden planner. We're gonna to continue to fill the weekly garden planner out uh, you know, for the rest of the year over the next few months. And then we're gonna just jump right back into it and kind of start over and fill in anything that we're missing. Uh, lots, of, lots, of more, lots more content coming to the weekly garden planner. So thank you guys who have already signed up for them. Uh, we really appreciate it. Most of the content this week uh, has been, all of the content has been in the garden here. We've planted a ton of new shrubs uh, into the garden, some things that we were, you know, some, some plants that we were missing. Uh, some, a few natives went in this week. Uh, annuals are going in. We're a little behind. We got a lot of annuals that need to go in the ground, things that we've started from seed and they're not, you know, you go from putting, you know, starting flower seeds, perennial seeds, vegetable seeds, whatever. And they look really good. There is a period of time, there is a, there's a moment though, uh, where they can crash on you a bit if you don't get them planted in the ground or planted into larger containers or something. And we're kind of at that moment where these things just really need to get in the ground. So we're concentrating on that in the next few videos. We'll be getting in all of our color borders, uh, all of our uh, annual plantings. The vegetable garden's already in, and you would have seen that video, the video right before the one, right before this one. Uh, this week has been, um, it's a busy week. I, I spoke to a student group on NC State campus on Monday night, and then I'm speaking at Ralston Blooms. I'm filming this on Friday. I'm doing Ralston Blooms on Saturday. You're watching this on Sunday, so this will be have been in the past <laughs> by the time you're seeing it. But I'm speaking at Ralston Blooms in the morning and then going down and making an appearance at a, um, well, going to, not making an appearance, but going to the Garden Gala down at uh, Johnson Nursery, down at the, uh, uh, Botanic Garden of Southeastern North Carolina on Saturday afternoon. So bu busy day there, but all fun, all fun things. Uh, so can't, can't wait for that. But again, as you're seeing this, it happened in the past. All right, we're gonna jump in uh, to some questions. And again, thank you guys who have signed up for the Weekly Garden Planner. We really appreciate it. We're gonna continue to fill it out. Uh, some news on the Learn to Garden video series for next Sunday. Uh, uh, that, that'll be coming up next Sunday, okay. Question number one, can shells, rocks, and bricks be used as mulch? Yeah, absolutely. I will say that, you know, what I've said all along is by covering the ground in organic material, which is just kind of the way nature does it in the eastern part of the country. Out, you know, out west, things are covered in, you know, some portion of the west is covered in rocks and, you know, desert you know, type materials um, that you would expect to see from, you know, about Dallas West in the Southwest. You know, the Pacific Northwest is more like the Southeast with, you know, a lot of greenery up in the, you know, the Western part of those states of Oregon and uh, Northern California and uh, Washington. But, um, you know, the places where we have, you know, lush greenery that just kind of naturally grows, I always think the best thing to cover the ground with is some sort of organic material that will break down. Uh, just because that feeds those micro soil microbes and keeps the engine going 
uh, in your garden. But there's nothing wrong, you know, with covering um, the ground with, you know, I see, go down to the beaches in North Carolina, lots of people use shells for, for mulch. And of course, lots of people use rock and bricks. I think up here, you will get what I call gravel regret up in this area of North Carolina and probably anywhere through the Piedmont where there's clay. Uh, it will, you know, those rocks will kind of sink into the ground a bit over time. Dirt will infill it. You know, all the things that get blown into the rocks will, you know, slowly but surely infill it and it won't look as good. It always looks so crispy when you do some sort of rock uh, mulch initially. And then, you know, over time uh, it can look, uh, it doesn't look as good. And, and then it's hard to get the material out. I, I, the reason I call it gravel regret is I've been paid many times in the past to pull gravel out of beds and, re, and, 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 re, and redo them. But with that said, yeah, you can use anything to keep the ground covered. At least you will be holding in moisture. You'll be holding in, um, you'll, you know, some some weed prevention, you know, to that, and some of the benefits of mulch. Just not the nutrients that are in organic mulches breaking down and being food for earthworms and beneficial fungi and bacteria. That's the thing you'll be losing uh, by using shells, rocks, or bricks. But of course. You know, once you put them down, they'll last much, much longer than this organic material would. So, you know, balancing act on anything, right? Uh, so somebody asked, does foliar feeding actually work and what do you use? I don't foliar feed any plants in this garden, but yes, foliar feeding absolutely works. And in greenhouse operations where they're growing, you know, annuals this time of year, perennials this time of year, they'll use what we call fertigation where they'll actually run fertilizer through the irrigation system. So as the water is, you know, um, as the plants are being watered in the greenhouse, fertilizer's in the water. So it's, you know, the, it's being up, you know, the fertilizer is actually being taken up through the foliage directly on the plant. So it absolutely works. Um, the reason they're doing it in a greenhouse is because they want to turn, they want to grow those petunias or whatever they're growing as fast as they possibly can and get them out to you as fast as they possibly can. In doing so, though, you do invite pest. It, you know, the, when you push a plant so hard, uh, maybe you can see Holly over here now, I don't know. Uh, when you push a plant that hard, you have the potential to invite pest uh, into your garden as well. So keep that in mind, that uh, pushing plant, there's a limit to how hard I think you should push, try to push a plant in your own, in your own garden before it backfires on you a bit. And in a nursery setting, they're gonna do the fertigation, but they're also spraying potentially spraying fungicides and miticides and uh, insecticides and you know other things to uh, for some of the problems that come about from having pushed something way 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 too hard so um, you know keep keep that in mind but yes you can foliar feed your plants absolutely uh, with fertilizers but I just typically don't I'll just use you as you've seen I mean I, I it's a very small amount of fertilizer that we actually add to this garden and the vast majority of what's feeding these plants is just the natural system we've set up with our native soil and organic material. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody has a boxwood hedge that's too big. Can they top it off and ha cut it in half and when would they do it? I think you would, um, you can absolutely do this if you have an old boxwood hedge. Uh, if you're nervous about it though, you don't necessarily have to bring them down half at one time. You could bring them down like a quarter uh, and then let them start to flush out from lower into the plant, lower in the plant, and then cut it the rest of the way off if you're nervous about it. Uh, they can absolutely be cut off that way. Keep in mind, they're gonna be very naked <laughs> from halfway down. Uh, it's gonna look not the best for a while. Also, you'll be uncovering part of the plant that hasn't been in the sunlight, so it's gonna potentially burn the remaining leaves that are on it, the direct sun is. So it may go through, uh, it's gonna go through an ugly transition, but yes, almost all leafy evergreen plants that have some age on them uh, can be cut really, really hard. If you were gonna do it this year, you'd wanna do it before June for sure, uh, to have time enough for them to flush back out and have that foliage harden off uh, for that first winter, you know, that it's gonna be exposed to because boxwoods will, um, they're super, super cold hardy, but they're also, will sometimes grow at times they shouldn't be trying to grow and can get some burn on them. So you just want to do it early enough that it can go through the growth and then, you know, drop off that it needs to uh, in growth to go dormant 
uh, properly in the fall and not get damaged. Um, but it, you know, I do it all the time. I cut, if, especially if they're not making you happy, you might as well try it uh, and it, it'll be fine. Uh, somebody's asked this question a couple times and I think I wrote it down once and then forgot. They had a uh, barrel uh, out there in the Pacific Northwest. They had a barrel with a camellia growing in it for 20 years and the barrel has rotted away. And the camellia, I guess, is sitting up on a bit of a berm and one side of it's just completely barren. Uh, should they dare transplant it? I'd absolutely transplant it. Um, I wouldn't have a problem uh, transplanting it. Uh, it's already probably started its spring growth though. So this may not be the ideal time to go out there and, uh, uh, and move it. Maybe winter time would be a better uh, time before the new growth starts on it. Although you could prune back a little bit of that new growth uh, before you do it. And that might be helpful uh, to move it, but I'd absolutely move it and uh, get it somewhere where it can um, grow better than it is. I mean, you know, if it's, again, if it's not making you happy, give it a shot, you know, prune, prune it back, you know, prune the boxwoods back, move the camellia, you know, do whatever is necessary. Otherwise you're just stuck in a, you're just sitting there stuck. Um, and sometimes it's worth the risk of potentially killing something in order to, uh, um, you know, to not, uh, now 20 years, that, that camellia is going to be quite big. I would imagine you could root prune it first and leave it there for, uh, actually sometime in the summer, or let's say in the early fall, you could root prune it and then move it during the winter time. Um, that would be the best scenario probably. Holly's been fascinated with something back there behind that building for the last week. I don't know if it's a, a dead animal or something, but she keeps disappearing back there. So every time I see her kind of slowly make it, she knows she's not supposed to go back there, but she's been slowly creeping back there as I've been answering, answering questions. So. I had to go ahead and put her, go ahead and put her inside. Do red buds need to be planted high for drainage? I plant everything high. If you're in clay soils and you're initially planting something uh, in the ground, uh, no matter what. And the main reason for it is because there's um, down in that clay, that, that plant's been in this really well-drained bark and potentially a little, maybe a little bit of sand uh, mix and uh, some composted pine bark. That's what that, that tree has been grown in for all that time. And it's had all this air and uh, perfect conditions to root out entirely into that container. If I go stink that entire thing down into a clay, basically a clay pot underground, those roots that are at the very bottom of that are just not going to be able to breathe. They're almost all going to die uh, pretty quickly, actually. In fact, if you go and take up most of the plants that I've been transplanting in this garden, they were, the root ball was this deep when I planted them. Now it's, you know, two thirds that depth and wider. Most plants, you know, root wider in the ground than they do in those containers. So the, it, because of my clay based soil, some of the bottom of those roots are going to die anyway. So I just plant, just in general, plant everything up high uh, in this clay soil. And, you know, if a red bud seed germinated directly on the ground, it wouldn't be up high, but those roots would volunteer to go where they want to go and they're, you know, in full control of where they're going to go. When you're planting something, you know, that's in a container in the ground, I'm not really giving those bottom roots a whole lot of choice about where they can, where they're going to go. Right. But if this was a seedling and it seeded itself, like red buds do, uh, the roots would just go in the ground where they wanted to go and where they could go and where, you know, made it comfortable uh, to be. But again, so I, I'm just leaving everything up regardless of what it is in this clay soil, you know, about, you know, a couple inches. And also plants are going to sink a bit. You're going to dig those holes and that loose soil is going to be at the bottom of that hole and the plant's going to sink some anyway. So leaving it up a couple inches, an inch of that's probably going to go away. The plant just kind of, you know, as everything settles, it's going to sink a little bit. Um, how much sun does our Laura Petalum get? Would it be a good choice as a windscreen? Uh, this particular Laura Petalum gets, uh, maybe six or seven hours of direct sun, but it's up when the sun's up pretty high. So it's getting pretty good sunlight. The one over here on the edge gets less than that during the summertime, uh, probably only about four hours. The, our Laura Petalum are all over the place and how much sun they're getting uh, during the summertime. In terms of whether they make a good windscreen, I would not, I would not use them as a windscreen in zone seven, uh, in zone, um, because they're not, 
they're hardy in zone seven to nine or seven to 10, uh, probably 10 in California. Uh, but uh, in zone seven, they can definitely take some burn in the winter time. So if you put them in the direct winter wind, then um, you know, they're, they're more likely to take some damage. So yes, uh, okay windscreen in zone eight or nine, um, possibly 10, but not in zone seven. Uh, and there's probably better windscreen things that are a little bit more rigid. The large lower petalum over there kind of is like this. It's kind of wispy. Uh, whereas the Osmanthus fragrance uh, over there are rigid and upright. Hollies would be more rigid and upright. Uh, they may be better for actually blocking the wind. Uh, the lower petalum just kind of whips around, probably allows a lot of the wind right through it. Number seven, somebody said, how do they plant peonies and how, how deep do you plant them? And then just general care. Peonies need lots of sunlight uh, during the uh, spring season because that's when they're coming up and they're, they're, they're doing most of, their, most of their performing. I think you can see the pink peonies back here. I have a, uh, right here, there's lots of them. Lots more, lots more coming. We have several peonies back over here. We're in the southern edge of where a lot of peonies uh, perform. There are some that are more heat tolerant uh, that, that can go a little further south, but we're, we're kind of near the southern edge of where the vast, we can grow the vast majority of, of peony uh, varieties and cultivars. They barely get covered. So when you plant peonies, especially in our clay soil, you just, I mean, you, we barely cover them at all. And then the mulch basically is what they're buried in. So if you will go back and watch that transplant video, I barely covered them at all, maybe an inch of kind of composted soil. And then the mulch went over top of them. And it takes a little while for them to really perform uh, in the garden. I think anybody who grows peonies will tell you that. Just to, and it depends on the size pot you're buying. and. Uh, uh, or or whether, how, if the tubers are in, you know, the ones you just buy in little bags off the shelf, they're going to take a few years uh, to perform. But those are in their third year, and they are kind of peak now. Uh, really, really nice, large foliage, nice, large flowers. Uh, but plant them very shallow. That's the key. And then full sun in a mulched base, and, you know, they thrive. Uh, they're, per they're, pretty, they're pretty easy. Uh, just take a minute to get established. Does a, plant, um, does a plant need to be young to tree form it? So we have, we're tree forming older plants in this garden uh, that have been in the process of tree forming themselves. You'll notice that shrubs will just kind of naturally tree form themselves. There's a, peer, there's a moment where they don't get enough light down in the bottom and they start to lose foliage down in the bottom. And so they, you know, so old plants will just kind of tree form themselves. So it doesn't matter if it's a new plant or an old plant, you can tree form them. The difference though is if I start with a young plant, I can really manipulate it, all right? I can take my Chinese snowball viburnum over there or this uh, paniculata that's way back in the, uh, way back in the scene next to the uh, building back there. Those are young plants and I'm able to really manipulate those and shape them into something that I want them to look like in the future. Whereas with an old plant, you may not be you know, you got what you got. You got the trunks that you have, you've got the shape that you have, you know, uh, so it's, it may be that you can't create the vision, you know, that you have with an older plant, but any plant can be tree formed. And, and a lot of plants just tree form themselves uh, or any shrub can be tree formed. Um, and most, of, a lot of them will just do it in time anyway. Uh, okay, so rooted cuttings, um, can they be transitioned outside? Uh, so I just want to answer this as seedlings and everything. So if you have seeded things you're doing inside, um, you've rooted some cuttings last year and you've held them in the winter in a greenhouse or in the inside your own, inside the house house, um, you know, how do you transition them outside? You just need to do it slowly. We have trays of things out here. Uh, I'll grab one. We have, you know, trays of seedlings that we've been, you know, that we've been working on for months now. And, you know, in the house, no matter how much light I put on them on that light rack, it's not the full sun. So keep in mind that you will burn plants, bringing them from inside of a greenhouse. Cause that plastic, even if it's just under what appears to be clear plastic, that clear plastic is blocking 20, 30% of the sun. If they're under a shade cloth, it might be blocking 50% of the sun. Those light racks in the house are probably only 
you know, 60 or 60 percent of the full sun. I, whatever. I, I don't. I don't know what percentage. It depends on how bright your lights are, obviously. Uh, but transitioning them outside is super important that you do it slowly. So we bring, we'll bring things out in the late afternoon and let them get some of the, the sun as it's on a slight angle going down and leave them out and then just transition them a few hours a day. Had some activity, had to take a break. I hope I answered the transitioning cuttings outside thing. But yes, as soon as you can get things, the sooner you can get them out into the full sun, the better, but do it in steps. Okay, let's see. Drawbacks from planting a tree where a tree has been taken down. So they had an oak they they took down or what, for whatever reason had to come down. They ground the stump and then they want to come back and plant a tree. We waited about six or eight months before we planted the service berry where the red maple was in the front garden and let some of that material where they had ground the stump break down some. I will say even with the, with the stump ground out, there's going to be some material left there and that's it's going to settle in the future. Uh, and the tree can actually end up uh, leaned over. Um, that, if, I, if that video hasn't gone up as you're seeing it, I talked about our uh, service berry out front. It leaned during the winter time, but not from a wind or anything, from, from the ground actually sinking uh, next to it. So the longer you can wait in between, probably the better. Um, but, you know, we waited about six or eight months and now um, that area is just going to continue to settle some. It just is. No, no matter how much effort went into getting the stumps out, there's still material down there. Uh, let's see. Sent a bunch of pics. Okay, all right. Um, uh, Steph wrote the questions uh, down for me. Uh, there, uh, from all the t-shirt sales for the last couple weeks, thank you guys very much who have bought t-shirts. They're over on the Hort Tube with Jim Putnam website. There are more shirts in the process of we're working on and thank you guys for all the suggestions for t-shirts and a uh, few people have sent photos of you wearing the t-shirt so I appreciate all of that. Um, and uh, again, the new shirts are on the website uh, rather than below the video. Um, there's some down below the video from Teespring but the ones over on the website are where the new ones reside. Let's see. Uh, and the reason I started back in the same spot that I did last week filming this Q&A was because somebody asked, what is the tree over my right shoulder? And this is a Tokyo Tower. Uh, this, is a this is a Chinese fringe tree. Uh, this, is, this variety is called Tokyo Tower. Normally, Chinese fringe trees grow out and wide like this, and I mean really wide. Uh, sometimes I discourage people from growing Chinese fringe trees just because, I, one of my favorite trees, but uh, they do get wider than they get tall, but this one is one that was selected to grow upright called Tokyo Tower. It is not blooming as well in this garden as it does in other places because it's getting a little too much afternoon shade. I'm hopeful that as it gains some height, it will gain some sunlight a little earlier in the morning and then we'll get some flowers in the future. But that tree is, <laughs> if you know, I'm not, I'm not a garden perfectionist by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I, I, I like neat and orderly and I like, you know, for paths and, you know, some things. But the garden is, you know, kind of controlled chaos. Uh, you know, I, I would, I would kind of call it that. And if there's spots on leaves and, you know, a couple, a couple aphids on a spirea like there is in the front garden right now. None of that stuff bothers me. So I'm not going for perfection in any way, shape or form, but that tree is near perfection. <laughs> and that thing is, I think it's, unbel it's unbelievable uh, how, how, how clean the foliage is, how great the structure of that tree is, uh, just how, per you know, it's got this kind of burgundy-ish new growth as it's leafing out in the spring. Just a beautiful, absolutely beautiful tree. Okay, again, never going for perfection, but when something does stand out is almost perfect in a garden because it's, everything's out here trying to, you know, live its life, right? You know, and, and, and some things are damaging things and some things are helping things. And uh, when something stands out, it's never damaged. Uh, it's kind of amazing. Let's see. Uh, and we have a great native fringe tree as well, not knocking our native fringe tree in any way, shape or form, but the Chinese fringe trees are, uh, you know, pretty, pretty magical, uh, in the garden. Let's see. Um, okay. So let's real quick discussion on affording, um, new plants. I've been putting up a bunch of videos about, you know, with new plants in there and then, you know, just, uh, you know, there'll be a comment here or there that I'll see, you know, about affording things in the garden, you know, buying plants and that kind of thing. Keep in mind my old, at my old house, 
Uh, I worked overtime for a landscaper before I started my landscape company, and he the overtime hours I had, it was a small company, but we had an agree, a gentleman's agreement. They had a small nursery, uh, and uh, you know any overtime hours I worked, uh, the uh, the half hour part, the extra pay part, would go to me getting plants for the house. So I was working, I, you know, working a few hours a week to get money for the plants that were going into my garden. I was propagating things. I was dividing things. I was like, there was no money, you know. When I bought my first house uh, uh, before I started my, you know landscape company and then even after I started my landscape company for a long time I was taking plants from customers houses where they didn't want them you know they were paying me to take something out those were going to my house I had a there's a you know we we start I definitely want uh one of the things you know the takeaways from you know videos we're shooting is we've got containers over here where we've used things the third and fourth and fifth time and we're picking ground covers out of the garden to put in containers and we're uh, just recycling and reusing lots and lots of things and starting things from seed. I, I don't, you know, all these latest and greatest plants are great um, and they're fun, but there are older varieties of plants out there that are great and now underused and, you know, uh, they can be rooted, they can be bought for less money. Uh, and, you know, again, starting things from seed and, and that kind of things. But we have a lot of freebies in this garden where neighbors have dug something up and divided them. If you make gardening friends, make gardening friends, because if you make gardening friends, they won't let you leave their house without a plant. You know, we go to Ram and Tom Giberson's house and we're toting things out of there. You know, we'll bring them a few plants and then, you know, she, she gonna, if you've got trunk space, uh, she's gonna fill it up on the way out. Things that she's germinated and divided and work, you know. Uh, so make gardening friends and lots of free plants will, will come about from that and you can work on making some free plants for them as well. Moving over to a slightly different angle, can you trim back azaleas before you plant them? Uh, yeah, you definitely can prune back azaleas. It's all about, with azaleas, the timing matters. So if you were buying azaleas now, they're probably about to bloom or have already bloomed. Uh, a lot of them are almost bloomed out here. The spring blooming azaleas are uh, about bloomed out for the season and then you can prune them afterwards or you can prune them, you know, if you haven't bought a container and it's leggy or whatever, you can you can trim them some before you plant them. Keep in mind anything you're, when you prune something and you put it in the ground, it's not going to need as much water. You're gonna to need to water it in, but it's not going to use as much water as if it was actively flowering. There's a balance there. If you buy something in full flower and put it in the ground, it's gonna need a lot of water to support those flowers and all that new growth that's coming and everything. But if you shear something off a bit, which is what I do when I transplant things all the time, is that reduces the amount of water it's gonna use. So it could actually more easily be overwatered than underwatered uh, if you're pruning it. Okay, can you change the habit of a narrow shrub? So they, they give a Rosa Sharon as an example to make it wider. So yeah, Rosa Sharon tends to be upright and narrow um, overall, hibiscus syriacus. Uh, you know, I talked about in a couple of the pruning videos, uh, uh, and hold on, we'll move over to another spot. Just real quickly, I'll show you the hydrangea paniculata uh, tree form that I'm making here because I'm trying to broaden out the top of it uh, as, we, as we grow it out. The branches, each individual branch will have on this hydrangea, have buds on each side of the stem. So I can go back, if I cut any branch on this tree, I can see where the growth is gonna come from on the stem. And it, it, has, it has opposite uh, buds, so buds are on each side of the stem. When I cut this plant, I will produce growth uh, either on the, growth that'll either, either go to the outside or growth that'll come to the inside. Any, anytime I make a cut, anytime I make a pruning cut on this, when it starts to grow back out, I take off any of the growth that's heading back toward the middle. So as an example, that branch right there, I don't know if you can see it. There's a little branch. By cutting the end of this, I've stimulated growth down here. I don't want the branch that's going back to the middle. I only want the branches that are going to the outside. So here, you know, the, these branches that are heading out this direction, I'm gonna keep. Anything that's heading back into this direction toward the center, I'm not. So you're in full control of how you, uh, when you're pruning something. So when you prune that, you prune a little bit of height out of that Rosa Sharon, it's gonna stimulate growth all the way down through the plant. Take off everything that's heading back to the middle 
keep everything that's heading outside and you can slowly but surely make it slightly wider in time but you're in control um really fine control of the habit the plant's going to have in the future i started this tree form from nothing and um it's just leafing out so there's not a whole lot going on with it right this minute but once it's fully leafed out i'll come in here and prune out anything that's going back into the middle uh, from where we cut it toward the end of last season uh, and then keep everything that's coming to the outside because i'm trying to make it wider uh, and fuller up here at the top sun is starting to come out some i may not be able to stand in this spot very long uh is winter sun okay on hellebores yes in fact most of our those late winter flowering things like uh uh, like flowering bulbs, you know, daffodils or tulips or uh, those kinds of things, hyacinths, those kinds of things, uh, and in hellebores, any of those really, really early spring or late winter flowering things need a lot of sun. And they don't necessarily need sun during the middle of summer, and they don't want hellebores especially, you know, and, and of course the bulbs are asleep, you know, go back to sleep before summer. But during the period of time that they're actively growing and blooming, uh, that the sun is no problem plus the sun is still on a fairly you know the um uh, the angle of the sun that time of year is not bad and so the uh, uh they're not going to get burned from being in the sun during the winter they just need but they definitely don't want full sun in the summertime so somebody asked about vinegar as a herbicide i have uh, mentioned glyphosate a couple times in videos recently and one was because that lesser celadine question came up last week and i mentioned that really the only way to kill it is with glyphosate i don't um, you know, certainly not promoting the use of anything or not using anything. That, those, are, those decisions are up to you guys uh, on what, 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 how you're doing weed control in your garden. But there are some, some things like Bermuda grass and lesser celadine. I don't think you're getting away without at some point, you know, spraying something on them once they're out of control in your gardens. It's just, you know, there's, there's, there's some things that won't allow you to get to the starting line without doing something slightly more drastic. Okay, with that said though, somebody asked me, is vinegar a better herbicide? I did a video on using vinegar as a herbicide uh, several years ago at the old house. And you really have to get up to that 20% vinegar in order to really kill anything. Most of what you're seeing with the vinegar, and it's, it's, it's pretty satisfying to see, uh, you know, when you spray the vinegar, the top of the weed dies back, you know, like overnight. It just completely burns it off really, really quickly. But it doesn't kill the roots on it. A lot of times uh, so you're you know some things will come right back from it some things won't some things that'll kill you know kill dead um, you know just completely but a lot of other things it just burns the top of it off and it just comes right back so it's ineffective overall on some things regardless plus um, you know it's not a safe necessarily a safe thing that 20 percent vinegar has a label on the back of it that says causes permanent eye damage there's not a lot of if you look at all the chemistry all the chemicals that are available to you fungicides insecticides herbicides i don't spray any of these things in my garden but uh, you know if you read the labels on them they'll say protect your eyes wash flush your eye, you know flush your eyes immediately if you get it in your eyes that kind of thing and then there's the occasional label that says causes permanent eye damage so keep in mind that vinegar um, is pretty caustic and can be really damaging uh, to you. It's not, uh, it's a chemical as well. So don't, you know, don't, don't treat it as something that's um, any different than using glyphosate or any other chemical that you would use. And in some ways could be more harmful to you on a personal level. Plus it can change the pH of your soil, all kinds of issues with using it. And it's just overall, uh, not necessarily effective until you get to really high percentages of, uh, of vinegar. But then some people I'm sure are using it and having some success with it, but it will, has the potential to change your soil pH and, and cause some other issues uh, as well. And it's completely unforgiving, <laughs> like just like glyphosate. If you spray it on the wrong thing, it's gonna burn the foliage off of anything uh, that it gets on. Um, but treat it very carefully and make sure you're wearing goggles if you're spraying vinegar. Um, so needle, there, these folks have needle palms that are covered uh, with mealybugs um, on their porch. They're using alcohol. Is there any other suggestions? So yeah, I've seen people just take Q-tips with alcohol and kill mealybugs that way on plants that are in the house. They were asking if there's any cure. No, your needle palms are never going to be happy in a container on a covered porch. And the, so therefore, they're in a weak, slightly weakened state. So they're more likely to get things like mealybugs, spider mites, all of those kinds of things. I mean, I had... If, you, if I take, 
you know, if I take a gardenia and put it in the house and put it in the brightest window I have in the house, it's not gonna be as much light as that gardenia needs. And it's a thousand percent chance I'm gonna end up with white flies or uh, mites or something like that. So a lot of our, a lot of our insect um, related issues are the plants being in a weakened state and being vulnerable uh, and not being able to fight back against these kinds of insect problems. And a lot of that can come from inside the house. You watch, watch any house plant channel, they're talking about how to control mealybugs and spider mites and all of these things. You know, these plants just aren't necessarily happy in that really dry air environment and low light conditions, you know, that, that our houses um, that our houses have, our covered porches have, or that kind of thing. So, you know, there, I, the, the, my, my answer to it is there is no permanent solution. And I guess using alcohol to treat the mealybugs is the only way uh, you would ever, um, you know, that's what, that, it's just an ongoing thing. You know, there's no way to actually make the plant uh, like being in a container under a covered porch and uh, get it to a situation where it could really resist uh, some, of the, some of those issues. Uh, not 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 one of my <laughs> not an answer people want so somebody has a third of their sunshine ligustrum has lost leave what's up i get lots of sunshine ligustrum questions this time of year because the sunshine ligustrum is supposed to be evergreen sometimes for whatever reason they'll lose their leaves before new growth starts on them uh, so that a lot of evergreen plants lose leaves this time of year. If I look, if you look down in this lower petalum right now, if I, you look down in the center of it, there's a ton of red leaves on it that are dropping off as new foliage is starting on this plant. A lot of our evergreen, evergreen plants do that. They shed leaves as new leaves are coming in the spring. And those, those sunshine ligustrum and other plants, there are other plants that'll do it as well. My evergreen dogwood out front did it last year. It dropped a ton of leaves before new leaves uh, started on it. Uh, it, but it's normal for it to shed those leaves. They just got out of whack. They got out of line just a little bit. And then therefore it looked like it was, you know, had lost all its leaves and it had lost all its leaves. It just hadn't started to wake back up yet. So it'll flush right back out of it, but they do that. And it'll do it like some years it will and some years they won't. It's a brief window though. It's never more than about two months that you wouldn't have, uh, that you'd have gaps or holes or entirely uh, without leaves. Uh, so somebody underwatered their nightlight Camia cyparis. Uh, so any, th this question could be for any conifer and now it's brown inside, what should they do? So any conifer can have this problem. If you underwater them, like these leafy, these, these leafy plants like this, they'll all tell you when they're dry, they'll wilt, or a lot, of, most of them will, you can see it. And if you have enough experience with almost any leafy plant, you can walk past it and go, that thing needs water. You know, you can just tell how it looks. It's not even a wilt sometimes. Sometimes it can be a discoloration or just a slight curling in the leaf, something that's an indicator that that particular plant is dry. Every plant shows it a little differently. Uh, but conifers don't tell you anything. They just start dropping needles on the inside to compensate for the fact that they don't have enough water. So it was like, well, we'll just shed, shed half the foliage, you know, uh, overnight. <laughs> and what that leaves you with is a big brown interior to the conifer, which doesn't look as good. So what I do on those kinds of things is I'll let that new growth start on it and let it flush out for a while. And then I'll, I'll lightly prune that at some point this summer and allow a little bit of light down into it. But uh, I always say, don't double down on stress. So if the plant's already under stress, obviously, because it's lost a lot of its interior foliage, don't go out and prune it today. Uh, let it get back healthy again and growing again. And then after a month or two, do a little bit of shearing on top of it. Just stop the new growth and maybe that'll force some interior growth to come back on it. But yeah, but conifers are terrible. I've said it many, many times. They're the worst at letting you know they're dry. You need to check conifers more frequently than other things because um, they'll, just, they'll just shed. Uh, so somebody asked me about cypress mulch in general. I, don't, I, I like cypress mulch. I love the smell of cypress mulch. Uh, the only, uh, the only issue again is that, you know, uh, the only thing I'll ever say is I'm trying to get my mulch to break down in order to feed the plants. So this is my fertilizer. Uh, the slower the mulch is going to break down or going to brick or rock or, you know, um, hopefully not rubber mulch, but that's available to you as well. Uh, all of those kinds of, uh, um, anything that you're doing to put down in your beds is decorative to slow 
the amount of times you're actually doing it is also taking away um, you know, this stuff breaking down and feeding your plants quicker. Uh, so that's the only thing I would say about it. I, but I like cypress mulch, it's expensive, uh, but I do like the look of it, I like the smell of it. Um, again, it breaks down slower, which, you know, I, I guess, you know, using the logic that I don't, you know, if, if, the, if the purpose is I don't want to mulch as often, then it's a good idea, right? But if the, if the end game is to improve your soil as quick as possible, you know, using something that will break down quicker is probably a better idea. That's all I'll say. And again, those are all personal choices. If you want to, you know, brick mulch your entire garden, go for it. Uh, that's, you know, these things are, you know, these are personal uh, things that I'm not trying to, you know, again, I'm not the, the uh, gardening is a personal thing, you know, that in, and, and some people are going to like some things and not other things. I said that last week as well. And that's great. Uh, how often do you, should you change the soil in your container? So anytime we're, so that, that's this week we were, this particular year we've changed all the soil in our containers, but we went four years on a few of them uh, before we changed it. We were just changing a small amount where we were planting something new in the container on a year to year basis. Uh, <laughs> got a suet feeder over here and the birds have finally said, huh, he's not, he's not hurting us. So we'll come back in. So I got birds over here on the suet feeder. Uh, We'll change out a small amount every season in the upper part of the container where we're planting new plants. And then every third or fourth year, I'll flip the thing over and put all new soil in it. But we don't throw that soil away. It ends up under a plant somewhere in the vegetable garden or wherever. So it's get, still getting reused. Uh, but it, that soil does kind of run out of oomphah eventually. And it, some of it will break down near the bottom of the container and just become really wet all the time and it's not a great environment for your plants to be in so at some point you do need to flip them over and uh, change out the soil if you can unless it's a giant container you know this this big then not not as many choices uh, uh okay um so somebody has a fig uh they, they have a fig they're going to move it to near the house uh, it might be as close as three feet from the house. Is that a good idea? Uh, they have an on slab house. So the house is built on a you know, slab foundation um, instead of a crawl space foundation. I don't think the fig, figs do root super aggressively. So I definitely don't want to say it won't damage your foundation, but it's unlikely um, if it's a thick slab foundation. I don't think, I think the biggest issue is that even dwarf figs get gigantic. So a fig three feet from your house. I mean, my neighbor over here's got one that's three or four feet from the house. But that fig is 20 feet tall. Uh, it's not happy probably, you know, overall. Uh, and it's, it's just a big, big plant uh, to have that close to the house. I mean, think we call, I mean, technically figs are really shrubs, I guess, because they're generally multi-trunked, but uh, we call them fig trees for a reason. And I've seen figs as tall as 30 feet tall and 30 feet wide. So, you know, um, keep that in mind. It may not be a good idea to have one three feet from the house, not because of the damage to the foundation, but more just the space that it needs to grow uh, to be happy. Okay, um, so somebody's Ruby Falls, uh, I'm glad I'm standing here now. Somebody said their Ruby Falls red bud died halfway back, any thoughts? So the problem, you know, this is Golden Falls. Ruby Falls is the purple version of this. Uh, if this thing died halfway back, uh, the, that's the height. <laughs> the, the height of this plant where you buy it is the height of this plant. This thing has not grown at all in height since I put it in the ground. This is how tall it was. So what you're gonna need to do if you want it to be taller again is to take one of these small limbs that starts to come back from it and stake it up straight. Be right now, sooner the better as it's leafing out this time of year where you can still bend one and it not break. Once it becomes woody like this, there's no way I could bend this branch up, you know, to the top up there. So um, the sooner you can do a small branch and then stake that up for a while back to the height that you want it to form a new leader. And then that'll be the new height. I've got a neighbor that bought some over here that were, uh, that were three feet broad, bought some that were this tall and then I had to break the news to him that, that was as tall as they were going to get. And now he, I see when I walk past, he's got some pieces staked up where he's trying to gain some height. But that's what you need to do is stake a new leader up. Uh, sooner the better. 
Uh, let's see, I'm getting tons, and I just get absolute tons of red bud questions. Everybody wants all these new hybrid red buds and then they have issues, you know, of all kinds. It's kind of crazy. So somebody said their allium foliage is dying back and they're barely blooming. I don't know how old your bulbs were. So that would be one question. It's not necessarily the first year your alliums go in the ground may not be the best year for them. We have some, hopefully you'll be able to see back here that are about to open and flower. There'll be giant clusters like this. These last year, we have some here and out in the front garden as well. These last year were not big performers in the garden. It's taken a year for them to build up size to be able to do what this thing's about to do. And it'll be in a video, I'm sure, in the next week or so when these are in full bloom. But it's completely normal for the foliage to die back on alliums at the same time they're about to bloom. I wish all bulbs did this. Uh, but I really like this uh, on alliums because they, the foliage kind of gets out of the way and allows the flower to be the standout. My daffodils and tulips and all those things, long after they finish flowering, the uh, foliage is still standing up big and tall back here. We're waiting for it to die back. But alliums are just kind of the perfect bulb because the foliage comes up, looks great. It gets all its energy that it needs to form that flower spike. Then it forms that flower spike and the foliage gets the heck out of the way while the thing's in flower. Is there any breeding for zone six Loripetalum? And so it doesn't have to necessarily be a Loripetalum question at all. Uh, Loripetalum happen to be hardy in zones seven to nine, really seven B uh, without protection, seven A, they, they need to be in a protected uh, space. Uh, the problem with breeding zone six Loripetalum is there aren't there, you know, you can't, it's hard to take two zone seven to nine plants and create one that's more cold hardy. You kind of have to have some sort of interspecies hybrid to, in order to gain cold hardiness. So when we, you know, uh, there, um, there are some plants that are natives to the Southeast that are hardy all the way up to Canada. Uh, they j just, you know, got pushed down to the Southeast in colder Cold, you know, when when the globe, you know, when it was a little colder here in North America, uh, some plants got pushed down. So you might find that something is a southeast native, but it works all the way to, you know, the Canadian border. That's pretty common with a lot of southeast native plants. But these Asian leafy evergreen plants that are only hardy in zone seven, eight, nine, or eight, nine, ten, or you know, uh, like the Osmanthus fragrans over there, something like that you'd have to cross it with a species that was more cold hardy in order to gain that cold hardiness. It's just, you're, you're, you're basically breeding these things in a cul-de-sac and that cul-de-sac is plants that are hardy in zone seven to nine. How do you break out of that cul-de-sac uh, of, of breeding something in a circle, right? It's like, it's like taking two hydrangeas that get leaf spot problems and crossing them and hoping you don't end up with a hydrangea that gets leaf spot problems. You're just breeding them in a cul-de-sac, right? There's no, you have, to, you have to introduce another species or another plant that's resistant to it. Um, and you'd have to do the same thing with these. And that would be the problem is that there's just not one that is that hardy that you could cross with it. You'd have to cross it. This is in the witch hazel family. And perhaps, you know, something else in the witch hazel family, like, you know, our native witch hazels are very, very cold hardy. Could that be crossed together? Yeah, I don't know. You know, that's the, that's, the th that's the question. You'd have to introduce something into the breeding that's that cold hardy in order to gain it. Um, that's the only way that would happen. Uh, let's see, somebody asked if my, the, the bandana yellow lantana that we had last year uh, uh, seeds itself. We don't have the problem with lantana being invasive here in Raleigh. So I don't know which ones are more likely to be seedy and be, um, potentially invasive down in Florida and the other places where lantana are invasive. We just have winter takes care of that for us and we just don't have them come up from seed here. That's the funny thing about invasives, right? Um, an invasive, I've got that Sestrum parkee out in the front garden. It blooms all summer long. It's a fantastic plant, but winter slams it to the ground most winters and I don't have to worry about it. In Australia, it's one of the most invasive things in Australia. Miscanthus, we can grow miscanth uh, uh, miscanthus here without any problems. 
They don't come up from seed all over the place. Out in California, they're part of the fire problem is, is some of the uh, pampas grass and miscanthus and some of the other grasses that become invasive out there. So one person's invasive plant is another person's tame ornamental that doesn't have any issues in their gardens. Kind of, kind of an interesting thing. Um, how late to start perennials from seed? So this is a pretty good question because most of our perennial flowering things take a little longer from seed with some exceptions, with some exceptions. Whereas I can plant some annual things that I would grow like zinnias, uh, cosmos, those things I can seed and two or three weeks later, I can put them in the ground. Uh, most of our perennials that we do from seed take about eight weeks, 10 weeks sometimes. So you, if you're going to seed anything for perennials, this is you need to get on it as quick as possible because you, you're already probably mid-June before you could think about putting most things in the ground. Whereas again, I can plant a lot of my annual things um, right now and, and get them in the ground three to four or five weeks from now. So the sooner the better on perennials because you need to get them in the ground and get enough time on them in the ground before that first winter causes them an issue. Of course, you could start them a little later and then keep them in containers through the winter. The sun was definitely getting worse over there. We have a couple more. Um, how do we get lawn art? And somebody asked about, well, it was weird that I moved here because this, that butterfly house they were actually asking about. We actually got that one, I think at Logan's, uh, but that's not normally how we get things, uh, little garden art pieces. Uh, I'm in no rush to fill this garden with, with, with art. Um, this is something we do when we're on the road. So this is something that came from a place up in uh, the North Carolina mountains, this little butterfly. Uh, we have all kinds of things out here in the garden that are decorative like that, but I'm in no rush to acquire them. I would rather, I would rather all those things have a story. Okay, this, the story on this one is I bought it at a garden center in Raleigh, which is, fine, but I'd rather have uh, this little uh, this little mushroom. Uh, you know, this little mushroom came from, I think this was Atlanta Botanic Garden or one of the big botanic gardens. Uh, Steph, can, Steph could tell us better, you know, where we got this. So we got this on the road and we it's a memory. I'd rather have these kinds of things, these little extras in the garden, uh, you know, save some space for them and in your travels and when you visit Maybe you visit a friend's garden, whatever it is, and there's some memento you can have from those kinds of things. That's kind of what I like to reserve this garden art thing for. And we have plenty of space for it. We're just not in a hurry to acquire anything because I'd rather, again, for us, I'd rather have it tell a story. Last question for this week. Somebody asked about uh, shearing green giants, and so I just figured I'd make it a shearing conifers question in general. And then they ask about, it said some, mentioned something about Holly's changes in the videos over the years. She used to have a completely black face and uh, not completely, but a lot of her face was black and now she's, you know, got this gray face that's completely different. So she has evolved quite a bit in the seven years of shooting videos for this channel. She absolutely has uh, completely changed the way she looks. That dog has lived a real, has a pretty big life. She's, she's, um, She's, she's lived it. She's lived large. She's had the nursery. If you go back and look at my original videos, she's in the background at the nursery. She was the greeter at my garden center. People would stop. I had people, she would be laying at the door to the garden center looking out. And so people could see her when she, they rode by and people would stop just to come in and pet Holly. I think little kids loved, absolutely loved her. She's so tolerant of, uh, you know, of, you know, of, of little kids. Uh, and, uh, then, you know, here and all the background of the videos here, and she's done so much traveling. She's been, you know, she loves beaches. And so, you know, she's had good beach time. She's just had a, she's had a pretty good, she's had a pretty good run, but yeah, she's, she's, she's old. She's quite a bit older than when, we, when I started this channel, but she, uh, she in shearing conifers. I've got a neighbor over here. It's got Leyland Cypress. He's been shearing since I've been here and they'll probably be, he can, he's keeping them eight feet tall. And so it's, it's possible to keep things like green giants and emerald arborvita and Leyland Cypress and all of those big conifers pretty small at some point the trunks get big and they start to look weird from it. And you know, it has an expiration date, but that expiration date could probably be pushed out 15 years, you know, before it's, it's an actual issue. So, you know, if you want to shear on them as long as you can, uh, it's not going to hurt anything. Uh, the one, the one 
piece of caution I would give you is that Leyland Cypress, Green Giant Arborvita, they're, they are some, you know, there's, there's, if you live in a place with hurricanes, heavy winds, there is some possibility of blowover once they get to be 30 feet tall. So if you've done a tremendous amount of shearing on them and they're really, really full, they're gonna be more likely to block wind, you know, block, we're talking about blocking wind with plants. Well, if that thing becomes a wind block, it's just gonna potentially blow over. Whereas if it had a little bit of thinner, natu more natural habit, the wind might move through it a little easier. So keep that in mind that over shearing them could have some negative impact if they got, if you were going to ultimately allow them to get 30 or 40 feet tall. So, but again, you can, you can shear things for years and years and years and keep them much smaller and then pull them out and plant something else later. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no set rules on those kinds of things. So there you go. I don't know how many questions this actually was. I had 11 in the other book and maybe 25, 26, something like that. Again, you can ask questions down in the comment section below this video. Thank you so much uh, for um, following along with the channel. Again, the $30 discount on the weekly garden planner runs out on the end of the day on Tuesday. Uh, thank you guys who have signed up for it. And I think it's, uh, we'll continue to try to make this a helpful thing for you. And once you buy it, you own it. Uh, and we're just gonna keep working on it and keep making it better uh, over the years. Thank you guys so much for following along.